trust you guys all had a nice week. Nothing negative, right? It's all positive in our Messiah. He orchestrates everything right for our good. Hallelujah. Why don't we stand? And let's, before we sing, sing the uh, different blessings that will be on the screen momentarily, let's sing Shabbat Shalom together. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat 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 Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat 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 Shalom. Shabbat 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 Shalom. Shabbat 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 Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat 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 Shalom. Hey, Hallelujah. Amen. Hear, O Israel. I think you guys are ready to hear him, aren't you? Hallelujah. Please join with me in the Shema. Shema Israel, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad. Baruch Shem Kevod Malkuto Leolam Vayed. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh our Elohim, Yahweh is one. Blessed is the name of his esteemed kingdom for all eternity. Amen. And then the Shema continues with Ve'ahavta, which means, and you shall love. Ve'ahavta et Yahweh Elohecha bekol levavacha uvekol nafshaka uvekol mehodecha ve'hayu hadvarim ha'ele asher anoki Mitzavachayom alevo veka. Vishem nam tam leva neka virdi barta bam. Vishem te kaba veteka. Uva lek te kaba derek uvishark beka. Uv kumeka. Shartam leota yodeka, veha yuleta thafot beneneka, Octav tamo mazuzot beteka, Uvi shareka. And then in English, and you shall love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart with all your being, and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day be upon your heart. Teach them diligently to your children, and speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes, and write them on the doorposts of your house, and upon your gates. Amen. Now we have a blessing before the reading of the Torah. Barku et Yahweh Hamivorach, Baruch Yahweh Hamivorach Leolam Vayed, Baruch Yahweh Hamivorach Leolam Vayed, Baruch Ata Yahweh Loheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Bar Karbanu Mekoh HaHamim, Venatan Lanu Et Torato, Baruch Ata Yahweh, Baruch Shemo Noten HaTorah, Amen. Bless Yahweh, the Blessed One. Blessed is Yahweh, the Blessed One, for all eternity. Blessed art you, Yahweh, our Elohim, King of the universe, who has chosen us from among all peoples and gave us his Torah. Blessed are you, Yahweh. 
bless his name, giver of the Torah. Amen. Please remain standing if you can for the reading of the Torah. Today's Torah portion um, triennial is from 12.1 to 13.18, Genesis. And Yahweh said to Abram, Go yourself out of your land from your relatives and from your father's house to a land which I show you. And I shall make you, shall make you a great nation and bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. And I shall bless those who bless you and curse him who curses you. And, you, and in you all the clans of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram left, as Yahweh had commanded him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he sent out from Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions and they had, that they had gathered, and the beings whom they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan, and they came to the land of Canaan, and Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, as far as the terebinth tree of Morah. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land, and Yahweh appeared to Abram and said, To your seed I give this land. And he built there an altar to Yahweh, who had appeared to him. And from there, he moved to the mountain east of Baeth El. And he pitched his tent with Baeth El on the west and Ai on the east. And he built there an altar to Yahweh, and called on the name of Yahweh. And Abram sent out, continuing toward the south. And a scarcity of food came to be in the land. And Abram went down to Mitzrayim to dwell there, for the scarcity of food was severe in the land. And it came to be, when he was close to entering Mitzrayim, that he said to Sarai, his wife, See, I know that you are a beautiful woman to look at, and it shall be, when the Mitzrites see you, that they shall say, This is his wife, and they shall kill me, but let you live. Please say you are my sisters, so that it shall be well with me for your sake, and my life be spared because of you. And it came to be when Abram came into Mitzrayim that the Mitzrites saw the woman, that she was very beautiful. And Pharaoh's officials saw her and praised her before Pharaoh. And the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house, and he treated Abram well for her sake, and he had sheep and cattle and male donkeys and male and female servants and female donkeys and camels. But Yahweh plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this you have done to me? Why did you inform me that she was your wife? Or did not inform me. Why did you say she is my sister? And so I was going to take her for my wife. Look, here is your wife. Take her and go. And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him that they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. And Abram went up from Mitzrayim into the south, he and his wife and all that he had and lot with him. And Abram was very rich in livestock and silver and in gold. And he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai, to the place of the altar which he had made there at first. And there Abram called on the name of Yahweh. Now Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents, and the land was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together, for the possessions were great, so that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. And at that time, the Canaanites and the Perizzites dwelt in the land. Then Abram said to Lot, Let there be no strife between you and me, and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brothers. Is not all the land before you? Please separate from me. If you take the left, then I go to the right. Or if you go to the right, then I go to the left. And Lot lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of the yard, that it was well watered everywhere before Yahweh destroyed Saddam and Amorah. Like the garden of Yahweh, like the land of Mitzrayim, as you go toward Tesor. So Lot chose for himself all the plain of the yard, and Lot moved east. Thus they separated from each other, Abram dwelling in the land of Canaan, 
and Lot dwelling in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent as far as Saddam. But the men of Saddam were evil and sinned before Yahweh exceedingly so. And after Lot had separated from him, Yahweh said to Abram, Now lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which you see, I shall give you, give to you and your seed forever. And I shall make your seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could count the dust of the earth, then your seed also could be counted. Arise, walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. So Abram moved his tent and dwelt and dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mamre, which are in Hebron, and built an altar there to Yahweh. Amen. And then we have a blessing after the reading of the Torah. Baruch ata Yahweh Eloheinu melech haolam asher natan lanu Torah temet vakeye haolam nata betocheinu Baruch ata Yahweh Baruch shemo noten ha Torah Amen. Blessed are you, Yahweh, our Elohim, King of the Universe who has given us the Torah of truth and planted everlasting life within us. Blessed are you, Yahweh. Bless his name, giver of the Torah. Amen. And you may be seated. Before we begin, let's pray. Abba Father, I thank you and praise you for your great name, that we can lift up your name. In the name of Yahweh Yeshua, you have given us authority over demonic forces. We can come against them, cast them away in Yeshua's name. You have given us life, we choose life in you. Thank you and praise you, Yahweh, for your sacrifice going to the execution stake for each one of us. Abba Father, I pray right now that you would send your Ruach to teach us. In Yeshua's name, amen. This Torah portion is one of my favorite and I may say that about a lot of them, but I have a lot of favorites. You know, there's things that occur in our lives where Yahweh asks us to do things, and sometimes he doesn't tell us where or what the outcome is going to be, but he asks us to trust him just like he asked Abram to trust. You know, before this Torah portion here in chapter 12, verse 1, actually the whole Torah portion goes through chapter 17. And hopefully you guys read that. If you didn't, I encourage you to do that. Read the whole Torah portion, even though we're focusing on a just a one-third of it each Shabbat because there's so much in it. And this Torah portion, actually, you have to preface it back to a few verses back before chapter 12. And if you look in your scriptures, you'll see there at the end of chapter 11, in verse 29, say, that Avram says... And Nehor took wives. The name of Avram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nehor's wife, Milcah, and the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Yishka. This kind of gives you a background for Avram. And it says in verse 30 there, And Sarai was barren. She had no child. And it says, And Terach took his son Avram 
and his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law, Sarai, his son Avram's wife. And they went out from them, from ur Chasdim, to go to the land of Canaan. And they came to Haran and, he, and dwelt there. So the days of Terach came to be 205 years, and Terach died in Haran. You see there, guys, where it says that Terach, Av Avram's father, says that he took his family and he left to go to the land of Canaan. Up in verse 5 of chapter 12, or actually, yeah, verse 5 of chapter 12, it says, and Avram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the beings whom they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, came to the land of Canaan. So it appears that Yahweh had instructed Terak, Avram's father, to go to the land of Canaan. Just an observation, possibly. Otherwise, why would you have that same wording? Terak didn't make it to Canaan. He stopped in a place called Haran, which he'd probably named after his son that died. And it's possible that Terak was so overwhelmed with the grief of his son that died that he didn't go any farther. Being overwhelmed with the grief... He wasn't able to carry out what Yahweh possibly had shown him to do. So then Yahweh moved to the son, Avram, and instructed him to go. Grief can be something that can stop you, or it can be something that strengthens you. What do you guys think? You think we can be strengthened by hard things that we go through in our lives. But we're not supposed to let them overwhelm us and overcome us, are we? No. So here, the, just an observation, but it appears that Tarak, which would be Avram's father, didn't make it, didn't go all the way. Okay, has any ever have an experience like that in your life where it just kind of shuts you down? Perhaps a grief or something. I don't know exactly what verse it is, but I know it, it says that we're supposed to mourn the birth and rejoice in the death. And we seem to kind of have that backwards in the things that we do. Mm -hmm. We get all mm -hmm. emotional about it more than probably what we want us to do. Right. You know, I saw a television program one time where I think it was it was back east somewhere where they were there was this funeral procession going down the road and it was all mournful and and then all of a sudden it changed and it burst into rejoicing and they were continued on as they were rejoicing. And so I think that it's possible that Demonic forces want to try to shut you down so that you can't continue on with what Yahweh has for you. Do you guys think that is that's possible in other areas as well of your life where Yahweh would have you do something but the devil doesn't want you to? Anyway, just some observations I had. The name of the Torah portion is Lech Lecha. And if you look at chapter 12, verse 1, it says, And Yahweh said to Abraham, Go yourself out. The go out there is Lech Lecha. And the name of the Torah portion I've always found to be when you, when you delve into the meaning of it, it kind of takes in the whole Torah portion, the meaning of the whole Torah portion. So... When it says, get out or go out, 
it can be uh, looked at as a negative thing, perhaps. You ever have anybody say to you, get out? Kind of like a negative thing where they don't want you around, get out. Well, this isn't that way. This is a positive thing. Yahweh's telling Avram to go out, he says, from your land, from your relatives, and from your father's house. Now, why would he say that? Why would he say, go away from all your relatives and from your father's house? Any thoughts about why Yahweh would tell Avram that? Don. They were into such idolatrous uh, uh, things that they were doing and following not the ways of the uh, Shem and them. And so he had to separate them from them, and this is why he said this, I believe. Okay. I guess when I see go yourself out of this land, because Yahweh has a land that he wants to give to Avram, and it's not this land, it's a specific one that's promised. He says, go out from your relatives. So could that, could that land then be like Don was saying, like a paganism area where he wants to remove us from that and bring us into his, um, an inheritance that he would have for him as a land inheritance. So that could be looked at in that way, possibly. It says, go from your relatives and from your father's house. So relatives and father's house can be looked at the same. You know, it's relatives or your father's house. What takes place in, if you go over to someone's house and you walk into their house and they're doing things a certain way, do you tell them, oh, no, that's not the way you do it. This is the way you should do it. Do you guys do that when you go to someone's house? If they don't do it the way you want to do it? No? Okay. So I would say then that the father's house then would be kind of like, well, as I was growing up in my father's house, we had a way, uh, a spiritual way of worshiping. We had theologies that I grew up with. And perhaps Yahweh wanted to remove Avram from that because they didn't line up with Yahweh's word. So I see the Father's house as like the religion that we want to come out of. We want to come out of a religion that is not of Yahweh and into his um, you know, some people say that, you know, that you have your theologies and, and, yeah, my theologies line up with what Scripture says. But do they? I guess the only way we can find out is to dig into Torah and try to learn together. Pastor Rick. No, when you think about it, it's kind of like having to have to run a race, if you will. And you decide that you're going to stop like only halfway. What's the prize for that? You know, because according to, according to the regulations of the race, you have to complete the race. You have to cross the goal or there's no prize at all. Um, and, and you know what? Yahweh gave them a place to go. And that didn't include stopping short and staying there. And that's really the, the language that it uses is that they, they, they actually um, were in a fix where they, just, they sat down and was, it, it, uh, it describes being fixed or starting to build um, your, your town, if you will, there. And that's not where he wanted them to go. Um, his, he wants us to meet where him, he's not willing, Yahweh's not willing to meet and, and compromise and say, okay, well, seeing as how you, you're going through so much grief, I'll just make the place, the promised land where you're at. 
he had specifics that he wanted them to follow. Mm -hmm. and, and he wanted them to go all the way. Now, the truth is, is he wanted them to go all the way and receive that land because there was a blessing in doing so. There was a prize. There was a goal. So. Amen. Uh, we got, in witnessing to people, man, the biggest obstacle I come across to in witnessing to those in churchianity is their father and mother's belief, what they grew up in. Mm -hmm. And to, it, because they don't want to accept the truth, even if you show them the truth. And, they, and you can see their mind, and they're like, yeah, that looks real. But that would be saying my father and mother are wrong. And that... See, Asatan uses that so much. You can't go on the faith of another. At some point, you have to run on your own faith. You have to dig into the, the word yourself, not listen to your father or mother. When I was in church, Anna, we, they used to sing a, a song. It was a real catchy tune. Uh, the, that old-time religion. And the... And it would say, uh, it's good enough for mama, it's good enough for papa, it's good enough for me. And I used to sing that, and it's not good enough for me, <laughs> quietly, <laughs> to myself. But Because you can't hang on your mother and father. Muslims are brought up on their mother and father's religions. That's why they become suicide bombers. And this is what he did to Abraham. And a lot of times you have to lose everything. You have to separate yourself from your whole family and just rely on Yahweh. Hallelujah. Amen. I was looking at my uh, scripture here, and I had underlined some time ago, um, this kind of meant a lot to me. God may be trying to lead you to a place of greater service and usefulness for him. But don't let the comforts and security of your present position make you miss out on God's plan for you. And I see that here. Amen. Good. Someone else? I don't think it's so much about your mother and your father as it is that uh, youth today aren't taught so much to uh, have their own relationship with Yeshua and if you never develop a relationship then you're bound to go astray or be led astray even by your own parents so it's, it's just inst uh, making sure that uh, once installed knowing that they have to have that personal relationship themselves with Yeshua okay so it involves a personal relationship doesn't it amen not to be fixed on the flesh is kind of the idea. And the circumstances can, can make us uh, have ingrown eyeballs, if you will, if you've ever heard that expression. Mm. To get out is the name of the Torah portion again, Lech Lecha. To walk, to carry, to lead forth is this word get. And out wasn't in the concordance. So get out wasn't the, just the get part, which is yalak, which is this, just a yod in front of, of lech or lech lecha, which would be Yahweh's hand and his provision for you in order to get out. Have you guys ever heard the expression or the I think it's part of a verse, come out of her, my people. Okay? That's what Yahweh wants you to do. Come out of something that is not of Yahweh into what is of Yahweh. And what, how do we determine what that is? Is by studying Yahweh's Torah together so we can bounce things off of each other. Seeking to have the guidance from the Ruach, the whole Yahweh spirit, to teach us. So get out from what? Get out from not loving Yahweh and not loving your neighbor. So in other words, you want to start loving Yahweh and your neighbor as yourself. 
hey, can you love your neighbor or your brother right where he's at, even though he may irritate you? You have a brother or sister that, or perhaps a neighbor that irritates you. Can you love him right where he's at? Don't put a stumbling block, if you will, in the way of your brother by perhaps your understanding of Scripture when perhaps your brother's not there yet. Do you think maybe you weren't there once? And so let's be kind to one another in that way. And I know that that's what Yahweh is teaching us here. He's teaching us to, be, to do that. And I, I believe that we are doing that. We are being kind to one another. And you know what? When you start doing that, it becomes catching. And pretty soon, others will start doing the same thing. And you treat them that way. Hallelujah. Coming out. I couldn't find the word out in the concordance, so I, was, I just was meditating on it for a while, and I was thinking, what's out mean? in a spiritual application, not just a physical, where you're going from one location to another on the planet. What do you guys think? What's out mean? We talked about coming out of my people, so that means it's a spiritual application, right? You're going to come from one way of thinking to another. But how is it that did you arrive there by yourself, another, another spiritual application for something? Or did, perhaps did you had some guidance and some nudging that direction by Yahweh? I think so. I think that that's where we get it from, is Yahweh nudging us. But we, don't we have to choose, guys, to do that? Don't we have to choose to listen to him? So I just put separated from, so you're going to separate yourself. I put a different way of thinking, a paradigm shift. So this has to do then with um, how, how is it that Yahweh instills this in you, a different way of thinking or a paradigm shift? How does, how does Yahweh work with you to get you to go from one place to another in your spiritual walk? It's a question for you. Whatever you guys think, I want to hear from you too. Through the word, okay? Okay? That's what Marty was going to say too. Through the word. Through tribulation. Through tribulation, okay? Okay. myself it's uh, mainly a lot of times through the Ruach that he, he leads us in all truth okay the Ruach leads us into all truth amen good someone else how does Yahweh move you from one way of understanding of Yahweh to maybe a closer a more intimate walk with him How is it that Yahweh instills into your heart this? Well, I think a lot has to do with combination, you know, of your scriptures, reading your scriptures, and calling upon Yahweh's Ruach to help you. Also, we bounce things off of each other, and we learn together. So we want to be separated out. You know, we want, we want the light, the truth, and the, the life, opposite of the darkness, the lie, and the death. So we want the light, the truth, and the life. You know, John 14, 6, doesn't, isn't that what Yeshua said? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You know, years ago, guys, I, I was in, involved in a... Um, Hebraic congregation, and I had a guy come up to me and tell me that there's another way to Yahweh other than Yeshua. And this was a guy in our fellowship. 
And I said, really? Well, how's that? He says, well, he gave me some explanations. I don't remember exactly. But I, and I took him to that verse, and I read him that verse, and he didn't, he, he didn't say anything. Because that's the truth. So is it possible that that shut up the demonic lie that he, was, that he had believed? No one comes to the Father except through me, is what Yeshua said. Amen. You know, there's some more here in this first verse. If you have a question, raise your hand. Okay, so I got a question. Guy over here raising his hand. Don't know your name, brother, but right here. I was curious as if you were talking about when you said, come out for my people, Jeremiah 51, 45. Yeah. And so I looked up oh, every translation. And in the New International Version, come out of my people, run for your lives. Okay. Run for your life is in our Messiah, Yeshua. We don't run for your life in fear of man. We run because we fear our Yah and we want to delight ourselves in him so that he is pleased with us, okay? So, so thank you, brother, because that is important. We, we don't want to do anything that's going to displease our Father. And how do we know what displeases our Father or not is by his Torah, his teaching and instruction. Tim. Yeah, I, <clears throat> there must be a way that uh, the Lord must reveal Reveal, re, reveal himself to uh, people after they're dead to give them a chance to accept them. The reason why I say that is because there is a scripture that says those who lay down their lives to save a life shall have everlasting life. So if you don't know the Lord and you lay down your life to save somebody else's life, and you get receive everlasting life, you must have an opportunity to where you you uh, can know the Lord after you pass down or during that moment of, of life to death or something. So, uh, and, and then there's another scripture that says those who lay down their life for their country, uh, like, like a soldier uh, dying in battle, would receive life. So, it, but I never find a reference to where the Lord does, except for the one time when he's got the keys to hell, and uh, when he was crucified, and he spent three days. Oh. Did you hear anything I said? Yeah, I got it. Oh, good, because I may not remember it. <laughs> Anybody want to comment on that? Yeshua said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This man that I was talking to was into Judaism, and he thought that the Jews, the righteous Jews that believed in, they call him Hashem, because they won't say his name. There's a curse on them where they don't say his name, but there are some that have been have repented of that curse and now can say his name and call on Yahweh's name, but no one comes to the Father except through the Son. And that's not during death, that's in our lifetime, as Yeshua says. No one comes to the Father except through me. And, you know, if there was another way to our Messiah, What would that do? What would that be? Another way to our Messiah? Pastor Rick. Well, let's think about that because if there was another way, then there would be another God. That, that, that means there was another perfect person, the one that was without blemish that we could go through. And mm -hmm. the scripture is very clear that that he was the lamb chosen from, from the foundation of the world to be the one that mankind would, would be drawn to and would receive salvation through and the covering that was needed and come into that covenant. 
Um, even, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this today, but even, um, even scriptures that out of Revelation, where, we, where we, we're looking at end times, expresses um, the idea when you read it from, from some of the original languages that it was done at the foundation of the world. There was no other than him. And, and so we cannot, we, we cannot go on a premise, and, and I guess this is the danger of things, is that we cannot go on a premise that Scripture does not teach. In other words, in other words he is the lamb. Okay, it does, when, when we say he is the lamb that was slain at the foundation of, of the, the world, the word is identifies clearly that he is. There is no other. Amen. Good. I, I wasn't trying to <clears throat> imply that there's another way other than uh, Yeshua to, to, to be saved or, or to uh, go to, to the Father. But um, I, I know when he had the keys to hell and spent three days in hell, he was witnessing, was he not, to those that had died before his sacrifice, uh, giving them an opportunity to, to choose between him or staying where they are. Was that not the whole purpose in him spending the three days there? Uh, and, and the Bible, I believe, is true. So there must be a way that... that um, uh, if it says that uh, you will have salvation, uh, then there must be a way that that you're you're receiving the Lord. Uh, if you don't know, him. I, I just I don't know. And, and what about people in other parts of the world where there is no Christianity? I know today they say that there are many people who are uh, having dreams and visions of the Lord and coming to the Lord that way and leaving their Muslim religion or their Buddhist religion uh, because of, of uh, his visit upon them. So, Pastor Rick. Okay, and actually this is, this, this whole thing will probably pull it off topic a little bit. What I was addressing was the guy um, that, that uh, Steve was talking about, the one that he talked to. But also the, the passage of scripture that you brought up is actually has several schools of thought on what he was talking about at that point in time. Uh, some believe that it was through, through Noah, through Noah's message that, that the Messiah was speaking to those at the time that the flood happened and people perished about uh, the, and, and it was the people that are that at that time that rejected and are in a, in a um, in prison or in, in a place where uh, they're they're away from Yahweh there's all kinds of school of thought and and if, if we went into it today I would still wouldn't have time to finish <laughs> okay because there's just amazing uh, differences in thought in that particular passage and what that meant. Um, and, and we can talk about it some other time than this, uh, uh, than because it, that, that particular subject would take so much time. Uh, but there's, there's some amazing schools of thought on, on that that, uh, that is kind of fun to play with so, and to study. So. I want to bring you guys back to the beginning here, chapter 12, verse 1. The very first word in the Hebrew is Vayomer. It says, Vayomer Yahweh El Avraham Lech Lecha. That's how this verse starts out, Vayomer. Vayomer is translated in English the best that they could and spoke. Vayomer says, and spoke Yahweh. Isn't that great? And spoke Yahweh. Uh, that's, that deserves a hallelujah. It does. Because and spoke Yahweh. But you know what vayomer really means when you break it down? The vayat means woe, alas. And omer means to make well to do. 
Woe, alas, he's going to make you well to do if you follow what Yahweh is saying. That's what the, it begins with. That's not even the name of the Torah portion. The name of the poor, Torah portion is come out or get out. So get out, and I'm going to make you well to do. And it doesn't have to do with, with material things. It can. It can include that. But to make you well to do means that, in my opinion, means that you're going to be pleasing to Yahweh because you're going to be obedient to him. Okay? And when you're obedient to him, in other words, he's going to make you well to do, it, it has to do with uh, your relationship with him, with Yahweh, and with your fellow man. How is it that you can love your neighbor as yourself or your brother? Do not put a stumbling block before him, as Shaul talks about in Romans um, 14. He says, don't put a stumbling block in the way of your brother in regards to either eating or not eating. In other words, fasting or not fasting. That's what all of Romans 14 is about. It's about masters and servants and and the relationship between the servant and the master, and when the master says, this is a fast day for you, and it's, or it's not. Or another master says, yes, this is a fast day for you, or it's not. So, so, guys, it has to do with not putting a stumbling block before your brother. In other words, don't say to him, this is what you're supposed to be doing. Talk about Yahweh's scripture with him. Midrash it together. Let Yahweh do the convicting. You are not the Ruach. You just show him by your walk. Show him by your walk. Very Don't good. order him or push him. You show him by the way you do things. And he'll see the blessings and the joy in your life and Amen. then want that. Hmm. So Yahweh chose Avram instead because Terach, his father, stopped short. Something came between him and Yahweh, his grief perhaps, if reading between the lines. Don't let the demon of grief, if you will, overwhelm you. Yes, there is mourning period in time. If you lose a loved one, there's a time of mourning for them. But there's also rejoicing in everything. Doesn't Yahweh tell us in scripture that we're supposed to rejoice in everything? Hallelujah. Amen. So Avram left, verse 4. If you look at chapter 12, verse 4 here, it says, as Yahweh had commanded him, and Lot went with him. Oh, wait a minute. Lot went with him. Didn't he just give instructions to Avram not to, take his, to leave his relatives? Come on, guys. He was supposed to leave Lot. That's a relative. And look what happened later. They, they needed to separate later. In our Torah portion, it talks about them having to separate because of strife going on between Lot. Lot's eyes were fixed on the flesh, if you will, at least at that time. So Yahweh said in verse 1, chapter 12, verse 1, get out, go out from your land, from your relatives, and from your father's house. What's Avram do? He takes Lot with him. But, but it doesn't appear here that Yahweh is reprimanding Abraham. You know why he's not reprimanding him right away? We need to learn through trials. And that sometimes that's the only way that we can learn is through trials. Go ahead. I... I have to disagree with you on that. And I've heard that from others, and I disagree with uh, that it was wrong for that he was disobeying Yahweh by taking Lot. Um, I believe Yah Lot was probably a member of his household at that point. If his brother died, and Lot, we don't know how long Lot you know, was in Abraham's household. That would make him a part. Uh, to leave your relatives, you could say your son and daughter is your relative, 
and was he to leave them or take them with him? But I, I think Lot was a part of his household, and that was not a disobedient thing in any way. Just okay. comment. What I want, um, what I want us to do, and Darren used the word disagree, and I like the word disagree, but I don't like the word disagree. I like the fact that Darren has a different perspective. What, what could you say that would be, because the word disagree can be, not picking on you, brother. The word disagree, the word disagree can throw up a wall. When you come up to someone and say, I disagree with you, can that throw up a wall? It didn't throw up a wall between me and Darren, because I love Darren. But just for just a side note, just kind of hit me. What, we, what could Darren say instead of, I disagree with you? I have a different opinion, okay? Something else Darren could say. I interpret it this way, okay? okay. I hate your view. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> or you could say, oh, hey, that's, a, that's interesting that you should say that. What about this perspective? Okay, so another way of, if we're really, really close as brothers and sisters, guys, yeah, we can say, I disagree with you, but, but if you're talking to somebody else that may not be where you're at, perhaps maybe it's in another um, um, a religion, perhaps, a religion, we want to use words that draw people to us, draw people to Yahweh. Okay, so just, just a thought for you. Um, there is a famine that goes on in the land, and Avraham has to go down to Mitzrayim. Now, I asked my son to read this passage for me and come back and tell me what he thought. So he goes away, and he reads chapter 12 and 13, and he comes back, and the first thing he said was, what's wrong with Avraham? How come he, how come he offered up and said that his wife was his sister. Didn't he believe Yahweh? What was he afraid of? Well, that's the first thing that he, my son told me. And I said, well, that's true. He was fearful, wasn't he? Yeah, Sarai was his sister. It also became his wife. He, he lied, but he didn't tell, he told the truth, but he didn't tell all the truth. So actually he lied because he was afraid. Verses 11, look at verse 11 and 12 and 13. And it came to be when he was close to entering into Mitzrayim that he said to Sarah, I see, you, I know that you are a beautiful woman to look at. They're going to kill me for you, basically. And you know why? Because that's what the Mitzrayim's culture was. It was considered against their belief to take another man's wife. So what you do is you kill the husband, and then you can have the wife. That was their culture. That was their, the way they believed. So Avraham obviously knew that. So the spirit of fear came on Avraham. Spirit of fear is alive and well today, just like it was back then. That spirit of fear acting back then what do you suppose Avraham should have done? Yeah, Yahweh still worked it out, didn't he? For good. But what should Avraham have done? Leave his wife behind and gone himself, okay? Someone else? Told him the truth? What? Called out to Yahweh. Hey, what a concept. How about if the spirit of fear comes on you, you know that it is, and you cast that fear out in the name of Yeshua, and then you say, Yahweh, what is it that you want me to do? You ask Yahweh what to do. Don't just go and do it yourself, but ask him what to do. And do you think that he will answer you? Yeah, he will answer you. Hallelujah. Pastor Rick. It's kind of interesting because we all kind of do it at times. And it's that 
we think that Yahweh told us to do something, but he forgot about the process in between. You know, um, and we have to come to an understanding, just as Abraham did, we had to come to the understanding that he knew every step that, that he was going to guide you through when he gave you the command to go there. Amen. And, and so that would have covered him and his wife. And, and you know, I, I'm pretty sure that Yahweh could say, okay, I don't understand this part because I, I'm, I'm concerned that this is what gonna, this was going to happen. And he had a good enough relationship with Yahweh to be able to ask those questions. He did throughout the whole time that he was called. Mm -hmm. So, but human nature, fallen human nature, makes us think that, that, uh, that somehow Yahweh missed a couple steps. Look at the end of verse 13 in chapter 12. And my life be spared because of you, is what Avraham said to his wife. No, my life be spared because of Yahweh, because Yahweh is assuring me if I take the promises that Yahweh has spoken to me, then I know that I'm bulletproof until Yahweh's done with me. Okay, so Yahweh said to Avram in verse 2, I shall make a great nation of you and bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing and shall bless those that bless you and I shall bless those that bless you and I shall curse those that curse you. And in you, all the clans of the earth shall be blessed. What a promise, okay? Believe Yahweh for his promises. That's all I'm saying to do, believe him. And that's gonna cast out doubt, fear, anxiety, all of those wicked, evil entities that we just call a word, and they're not. They're evil entities that wanna come in and sidetrack us off of Yahweh's plan for us. Hallelujah. I just have one more thing to share with you. Abraham was 75 years old, it says there at the end of verse 4, when he went out. You know, it's interesting because the patriarchs, Abraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, and also included in that would be Yosef, and obviously our Messiah, Yeshua. If you look into their lives, their dates of birth, their things that happened in their lifetimes, there's a parallel with them to end times. For instance, with Avraham, it says he was 75 years old when he went out. If you back up 75 years from when Avraham was born, he was born in 1948 BCE. That's a parallel to the beginning of Israel, being born in 1948 CE. If you take when he went out 75 years later, and you add that to 1948 BC, CE, common era today, what's 1948 and 75 years? 2023. That's when he goes out to go back to the land. Just some food for thought for you. We're so out of time, so let's pray. Abba, Father, I thank you and praise you for your word. There's so much in it. Yahweh, you declare your works by your word, by your creation. You're supposed to de we are supposed to be declaring your works because we are part of your works, Yahweh. So help us to declare your works to our brethren, to our brothers and sisters, to our neighbor, and do it in such a way that is loving to where we... Show them the Messiah through, just through our walk. Perhaps it's just a smile. Allah, you said that we can know all about you. One day we'll see you as in a glass clearly instead of in as in a glass dimly. I thank you and praise you, Yahweh for our Messiah, Yeshua, dying for each one of us. He would have went to the execution stake if it was just for you and you alone. That's how much he loves you. 
Let us give him praise. Let us give him honor. Let's lift up his name, the name of Yahweh, our Messiah, Yeshua. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's stand. Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to Aharon and his sons, saying, This is how you shall bless the children of Israel. Say to them, Yahweh bless you and guard you. Yahweh make his face to shine upon you and show favor to you. Yahweh lift up his face upon you and give you peace. Thus they shall put Yahweh's name upon the children of Israel, and Yahweh himself shall bless you. Yivarecha Yahweh v'yishmarecha Yaher Yahweh panavalecha v'ikunecha Yasa Yahweh panavalecha Vehasem lecha shalom. Bring us back to you, Yahweh, and we shall return. Renew our days as of old. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. <laughs>